next month, um, more California natives. Uh, and Jim Bishop, who is a former San Diego uh, Society president and uh, San Diego uh, Horticulturist of the Year in 2019, uh, is going to go um, through a trip of Southern California Super Bloom 2019. And uh, January through July, 25 sites from deserts, mountains, inland valleys, to the coast. So they have it all uh, in a fairly short um, radius around there. So. We'd love to have you guys join us for that as well. So without further ado, I have um, like to present our speakers for the evening. Tonight we have uh, the folks that literally wrote the book on California native plants, gardening with California native plants and um, Bernstein is, um, and Bart, and David Frost, who is not with us tonight, but uh, Carol and uh, Bart are, and they wrote uh, California Native Plants for the Garden, and um, tonight they're going to um, fill in some of them that didn't make the cut, so these are kind of special, interesting plants that uh, we all should have in our gardens and uh, are definitely garden worthy. So Carol is a former director of the Living Collections of the National History Museum in Los Angeles County, uh, um, but recently retired. So now she's enjoying a life of luxury, gardening, educating, and I don't know what else, else she does, but lots of other things. She's keeping busy, but um, she's retired officially. Um, and for the last, that was for the last eight and a half years. And, um, she has been for nearly 30 years, the horticulturist of the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens, which as you all know, is all native um, plants. And uh, she co-authored two books, award-winning California native plants for the garden and reimagining the California lawn. Uh, she has, um, I didn't know this about Carol. Uh, Carol, uh, Bart and I went to, uh, um, to, uh, Chile this uh, oh, a year ago uh, in the um, fall, and uh, it was so much fun. But I didn't know this about Carol. She's um, introduced a couple of my favorite plants, um, Verbena lilacina de la Mina, which I just love saying, and it smells really good. We were, we were talking about smell earlier. And then uh, Corothrogeny felliginifolia, silver carpet, which I knew is um, uh, Lysingia, which is a nice, beautiful, um, flat plant with uh, lavender daisy-like flowers. She continues to share her knowledge of plants native to California and other Mediterranean regions through her teachings, writing, and design work. So she's definitely keeping very busy doing all that. And then of course, Bart, who is also um, uh, our beloved president who shared, uh, who started at Gerda Eisenberg's Yerba Buena Nursery up in Santa Cruz Mountains. I don't know if he started there, but that was one of his earlier uh, stints there. And then he joined uh, Ranch Santa Ana Botanic Gardens in the uh, 90s and served as the director of horticulture and then director of special projects. While down south, Bart served on the board of Southern California Horticultural Society. That's kind of our sister um, society and wrote up what they called um, the green sheets, which is kind of like our plant forums, but they're a little bit more detailed. And then he collect he collaborated uh, extensively with um, the Southern California Horticultural Society's um, a group of them uh, created the Selected Plants for Southern California Gardens, uh, a book that has decades of information regarding practical experiences from all of the little microclimates in Southern California. Bart Book. Uh, yeah, Bart moved back to the homeland of Northern California and is currently the director of botanic, regional botanic gardens in Tilden Park in the Berkeley Hills. And of course, the president of Cal Court. So I'd be glad to introduce these illustrious experts on California native plant gardens. Okay. Um, we well, wrote I this book say... in 2005 is when it was published. Right. Thank you, by the way, Ellen, for your introduction. And thank you, yes. Bart, for inviting me to do this with you. We're sorry that Dave couldn't join us. Um, 
I honestly don't remember, but I bet Bart does, how many plants are actually in California native plants for the garden. What I do remember is that there were a number of things we all three wanted to include and we just didn't have the space. And so I think Bart, you came up with this idea of if we were to write the book today or a revision of it today, which plants might we try to squeeze in there uh, to enhance the, uh, the menu, so to speak. And so we both came up with our own lists. Um, we agreed that we should be um, choosing plants that we have some personal experience with, either having grown them ourselves or observe them over many, many years at different um, garden situations, such as botanic gardens or other people's private gardens, and that they should be at least right. somewhat available in the nursery tray. Whether, um, you know, it was a retail nursery or occasionally through botanic garden plant sales. And so that was our basic criteria. And over the next roughly 45 minutes to an hour, you'll, you'll see what we came up with. So Bart, if you want to add to that, go ahead. Yeah, it was that there are over 500 plants in the book. Okay. Um, and that originally when we were asked to write it, um, they were thinking a hundred plants and we said, no way. There were just <laughs> way too many to include. And we did have a list of probably around 700 that we wanted to include, but I guess we should just get into the, the actual plants. First one, uh, Oh, and how we're gonna do this is we're both gonna talk about all the plants, but that if it's a plant I selected, I'll go first and then Carol will make some comments at the end and vice versa. And we're doing- Maybe, this. maybe not. I may not have things to say about some of yours, so. And uh, they're alphabetically by genus. So it's not trees and shrubs and perennials, it's just A, B, C. So Abies is first, Abies bracteata, San Lucia fir, one of our botanic garden's spectacular trees. Uh, there in nature, it's restricted to just the San Lucia mountains at the high elevations. Uh, it's not fireproof, so it's really above the fire lines in uh, the San Lucias. So in rockier, drier places. It also is considered one of the world's two most drought tolerant firs because firs are not generally drought tolerant at all. Uh, the other one being the Grecian fir, A.B. cephalonica. However, um, it's hard to find these for sale. They're slow growing, but again, as you can see, uh, these specimens here at the Botanic Garden are, are just gorgeous. Uh, they only produce cones up at the very top of the tree, and it's typically on a very narrow columnar section of growth. Um, and the other thing to mention is it is the only fir in the world with sharp pointed leaves, uh, which, and in addition to the long bracted cones, make it unique. Again, a beautiful uh, coniferous tree for a larger landscape or, or garden. Carol, do you have anything? The only thing I will add is that even though I do like this tree and I do think it's quite beautiful, um, those sharp needles are, they can be, you know, if, if you're going to put it in a garden, place it accordingly because they are not friendly. Otherwise, nothing else to add. Yeah, it's actually, if you know Torrea Californica, the needles are very similar, uh, mm -hmm. also very sharp pointed. And that this is even in section, AB section, something like Toriana, uh, based on that uh, similarity. This one is one of my favorites from Southern California. And I put that common name on it because that's where it usually is seen in Baja, California, in the Northwest of Baja. In California, it's only found in San Diego County in some just very unusual sites. 
uh, oftentimes heavy soils, oftentimes disturbed. But what it is, is you can see in the upper right image is two four inch pots here at the Botanic Garden. Uh, it does go through these different color phases through the year, uh, sometimes more dramatically than others. Uh, the lower right is summer, the lower left is kind of winter and spring, and that sort of blue-green one is in between when they're first flowering and the flowers are, are beginning to get spent. Uh, this is a plant that spreads very aggressively underground, making these beautiful ground covers. It's only a couple of inches high, only about four inches or less. The flower spikes can stick up a little bit higher, but not much. Um, what I have found is that it, it behaves a lot like strawberries in a garden. It will do this spectacular ground cover that you wish it would stay like that forever, but then it dies out and becomes patchy, um, which is fine if you, if you know it's gonna do that and you want a mixed low growing ground cover. I also like the sort of finely divided airy foliage. It's easy, you can water it or not. Is it fragrant? I had the same experience with that plant at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. We, we had it in our test plot and um, it spread outside of the raised bed into the surrounding soil for considerable distance and, and did really well for several years. And then just like Bart said, it slowly started to die back. And I'm not sure if it completely disappeared or not. I honestly don't remember, but it, it is beautiful when it's, um, when it's happy. I even like it when it's not happy and it's just a few <laughs> of them. Uh, we have a long established planting of it here at Tilden, where again, it's just spotty in with a bunch of other things. Uh, I think it's a great plant and it is usually available in nurseries, more in Southern California than Northern. Again, one of my favorite manzanitas and I've worked with manzanitas for years and years. This is uh, some individuals from collections of mine from Baja and it's Arctostaphylus australis. Um, at the time it was thought of, other than the widespread species uh, like pungents, which goes all the way down into Chiapas, Mexico, that this one was the furthest south otherwise. And that it gets, it reminds me of Arctostaphylus stanfordiana from Northern California, except it has blue gray leaves, which I find particularly attractive with the pink flowers. There are white flowered forms as well. They're kind of just intermixed. Uh, the plants usually get to be about, oh, four to six feet in height. Uh, typically very clean and beautiful foliage color. Carol? I wish that I could um, add some comments about this plant because it clearly is beautiful. Uh, I've never grown it. Yeah, it, it's one that is around, but it's, you, you have to search some. Um, and again, it, it seems to be very adaptable. We have it here at the Botanic Garden. We have many of them at Rancho. This is the, the lowest growing of all the manzanitas by far. Arctostaphylus hookeri subspecies Hurstiorum or the Hurst manzanita from um, Arroyo de la Cruz area in San Luis Obispo County. Uh, the image on the left is in the very lower left, you can actually see the ground. Uh, so those leaves are really right flat on the ground. For us, this species does not really mound up much at all. It just carpets. It does not keep weeds down one iota. Uh, so you have to weed, definitely. Uh, the one on the right is actually cascading over a wall. Um, and again, just coming straight down. Uh, seems to be very easy to grow. Um, and again, spreads quite far. Our biggest patch of it is probably about 10 feet or more across. I'm not sure how many individuals that represents. Carol? 
Well, I get to add, um, since Bart introduced this uh, species, that the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden introduced a selection of Hirstiorum that was a hybrid with Cruzensis, also from the Arroyo de la Cruz area. Um, when I got to SBBG, I, um, I noticed this plant in, our, in the Manzanita section there. It was collected back in the 70s and um, it was easily 10, maybe 12 feet across and also very, very prostrate and had good pink flowers, maybe a little pinker than this one that uh, Bart is showing and um, decided to give it a name and we called it Arroyo, de, um, Arroyo Cascade. And um, I've been disappointed actually that more wholesale nurseries didn't pick it up even though I distributed it to quite a few because for Southern California, um, it's a lot more tolerant of our dry, long dry summers than a lot of the Edmondsii and Uva Ursi selections that are more popular. So someday, hopefully, um, whether it's the species or the selection from SBBG, um, I'd love to see them um, more commercially available than they currently are. Oh, and I should have mentioned that that shadow pattern you're seeing on that upper left-hand image, that's actually branches of Archistaphylos refugioensis. Hmm. So this is being used as a ground cover underneath uh, that species. Okay, this one was on my list, another manzanita. Um, Arctostaphylus insularis is from um, the Channel Islands, and this particular cultivar, uh, Canyon Sparkles, was introduced by the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. I wrote down the date, actually, 1980, so it goes way back. Um, it's, it's fairly um, easy to get these days, which I'm happy about. Um, this was originally collected um, as seed from Santa Cruz Island and Dara Emring who was the plant propagator and horticulturist um, at the time, he selected this particular individual for its um, especially large, um, vibrant white uh, flower clusters. The other thing about the species that is notable, as you can see it with the photograph on the left, is the beautiful exfoliating bark. It almost has a bit of a ghostly color to it when it starts peeling. And it's a handsome shrub that can get to be many, somewhere between six and eight feet tall and roughly as wide. Bright green leaves, um, the pendulous flower clusters, and it'll tolerate um, a fair amount of shade. So that's a nice um, feature as well. So I think this is our last manzanita. Um, I was actually surprised when we were putting together this list that we hadn't put Lester Roundtree in the book. Um, to me, it's one of the most spectacular of the larger, um, almost arborescent types of manzanitas. Um, and of course, named after famous um, collector, botanist, and horticulturist and writer. Um, I was looking at uh, an article that Bart had written about manzanitas, um, describing the, the history of this one. Lester collected the seed then gave it to Lewis Edmonds to grow, and then he gave plants of this to Rancho. And Percy Everett selected this particular specimen, apparently, because of the beautiful pink flowers. Um, and then it was named by John Dorley. So four very important um, people in the history of California horticulture had something to do with this selection. Uh, the plant on the left uh, is the um, biggest specimen that I'm aware of. There may be others, um, but that's down at Tree of Life Nursery. And then a close-up of the pink flowers. And the bottom right is just showing it paired with uh, Artemisia montara in a garden right around the block from where I live. So beautiful blue-gray foliage with those pink flowers, not unlike the combination that Bart was appraising of Australis. A species with uh, somewhat uncertain parentage. Um, I've seen Pajaroensis as being one possible parent and Obispoensis as another. The seed collection was supposedly of Obispoensis uh, that Lester Roundtree made. The original plant at Rancho Santa Ana was over 30 feet across and wow. was about 
15 feet tall. It was enormous. Um, so a gigantic plant. Um, I wouldn't say that every specimen will get that big, um, particularly up here in Northern California, the biggest one I've seen is only about 15 feet across. Oh, the other thing I should say, just in closing about it, the photo of the flowers, um, typically they're much richer and pinker than that. Uh, that looks a little washed out to me. And oftentimes the flower clusters are a bit bigger. I think I took that photo, which is washed out, I agree, but you know, it never was a really rich pink, the specimens that we, that we had at the nature gardens, which is where I believe I took that photo. Um, yeah, the degree nice of pink, but not very stat, not deeply saturated. The, the pinkness in manzanita flowers does vary considerably from year to year, and yeah. nobody is really sure why. Well, and the one in the bottom photo is even paler. I mean, it yeah. is pink, but it's, it's paler still. And that usually, I mean, I would call that lower one even white. I mean, and typically Lester Roundtree, well, why it was selected was the foliage and the rich pink flowers. Mm -hmm. So this is a really important um, hybrid of uh, coyote brush that is um, prominently featured in the nature gardens at the Natural History Museum. Um, you're seeing several different images of it, um, kind of getting a little bit bushy um, in the upper left, um, a, a recently shared version of it, uh, the same, almost the same, I think it's the same bed actually, on the upper right. And then the lower left is uh, the, a uh, different portion of it in full flower. And this is actually a female clone, so it only has female flowers. And then showing a, one of the many, many, many insects that visit these flowers, despite the fact that they're not terribly showy. And um, there's a lot of nectar in there. And this is a hair streak butterfly um, having, a, having a feast here. Um, this is one of the plants that our curator of uh, entomology at the museum was particularly jazzed about because it is so good at attracting uh, pollinators. And as you can see, it was used as a formal clipped hedge. Um, this was selected by um, the landscape architect from Neil Ayer's office that uh, did the original design for the gardens to be a native alternative, a more a water thrifty alternative to uh, the very conventional and traditional boxwood hedge. So it, if not pruned, it can get to be easily four and even up to six feet tall and wide, but it can be kept to smaller dimension with regular pruning. Bart? Yeah, it's one that um, at Rancho, they got huge. I mean, uh, I'd say six feet minimum um and very billowy um we didn't typically prune them uh and then when they went to seed there were just clouds of seed everywhere and the seeds can germinate i will put that out there uh backwards do flower at a good time for a lot of insects not just pollinators, but beetles and all kinds of other things, visit them. And like many backers, you can whack this thing back to a stub in like January, February, and then just hit it with a little bit of fertilizer and poof, they come right back. You can do that with almost any of the California uh, <laughs> landscape type backers. So the Pilularis sor sorts, Centennial and many others. I'll just add that um, the name, I didn't know until preparing to give this talk, that the name honors the University of Arizona, which was responsible for introducing this plant, and it acknowledged the 100th year anniversary of that university. And this uh, is you, Bart. Ceanothus Blue Cascade. Uh, this is a rancho introduction from many years ago. 
uh, that never really caught on and there's no good reason for that. It is a spectacular plant. Uh, it flowers profusely almost every year. Uh, the foliage is kind of, um, oh, not, well, narrowly obovate, uh, looks kind of just blocky uh, and kind of shiny. So it's nice even when it's not in flower. The <clears throat> flowers are sort of like it, the inset shows. They're kind of individually frosted, uh, almost like frosty blue is, except that this plant is more the, the large arching uh, shape of a concha or a dark star, except it's bigger um, and a paler blue. So it really shows off well in the landscape. Uh, it also be, does better in heat than Concha and Dark Star and Julia Phelps. Uh, the latter two, Dark Star and Julia Phelps, are impressive sorts. Um, Concha is more complicated. Uh, I found it did better also inland, but this does even better. So it's something that I actually brought up here to the Botanic Garden and we've been propagating them for sale for our plant sales and actually have a pretty good crop of them coming along right now. Again, it gets to be about, oh, easily six feet uh, tall, frequently a bit more and then spreads a lot wider. So it's a big Ceanothus, but not as big as Ray Hartman, not as big as Frosty, uh, Frosty Blue or uh, any number of the real big ones. I've never grown it. You know, I thought I had um, when I was at SBBG, but um, my memory is just blank on this plant. So I'm not sure that we ever had it, which is too bad because it yeah. is pretty. This one though, um, that's uh, a plant that also these photos are taken from the uh, nature gardens. Um, so you know this blue jeans and I, I have grown this one myself. Um, I just love the texture and the flower color, uh, uh, the foliage as well. It's supposedly a selection of purpureus. Um, this was introduced by Rancho. So I know Bart will have something to say about it. The um, plant starts flowering, I think it's pretty, pretty late winter. I think it, I haven't been to the museum since they're shut down, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's starting to flower right now or at least budding up. And when it's in full bloom, it's just completely covered um, with these beautiful lavender blue flowers. The leaves are pretty small, thick and leathery. Um, and the plants that you see here, the plant you see here is on the outside of the uh, nature gardens along Exposition Boulevard. We planted several of them out there and they're holding up to street traffic, which is um, um, impressive because we've had actually a lot of problems out there with um, just a breakage and whatnot, but they've, they've held their own and they grew pretty fast and very low in terms of water requirement. Um, they seem to do, but they flower best in full sun, but they tolerate a little bit of shade as well. And of course, visited by lots of, uh, lots of different kinds of insects. The, this one is maybe about four or five feet tall, the one you're looking at in this photo. And apparently it can get to be about six feet or so wide, tall and wide, maybe even a little bit wider. Bart? Yeah, I'd say it's usually a little bit wider and it can get up to about eight feet. Um, complex parentage. Um, I don't really see that much purpureus in it. Uh, the leaves aren't nearly large enough. Um, it was never one of my favorites, even though it's a Rancho introduction. Um, the one thing I will say is that Sunset and many, many references say that this one is much more deer proof than others, and that is definitely not true. Um, it's the deer will nibble on this one as much as they will on all the others. The really nice thing about Ceanothus flowering so early is that they are one of the plants that the bumblebees really depend on 
uh, to get their colonies going uh, each year. So they're excellent for that, all ceanothus. Uh, so if you don't think that there's much in the way of purpureus in this, what do you think the parentage might be? I think there's many possibilities. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that, okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I selected the uh, Cianelthus megacarpus as well, um, big pod Cianelthus, which is quite widespread in, in Southern California, very common in the chaparral. Um, I love this plant for its clouds, this just billowing clouds of white flowers. Um, in many years and during my time in Santa Barbara, the, the slopes, the south facing slopes of the Santinez range would just be completely white. It looked like snow in, snow in you know, November, December, January, the time of year that it flowered varied from one year to the next. But it's definitely on the early side, um, which adds you know, a lot of color and fragrance. This one smells intensely to me like fresh corn tortillas, more so than a lot of the other Cianothus. Um, and the other thing that I really, really appreciate about this Cianothus is in the upper right photograph is the dimpled, um, almost woven um, character of the bark. I would say that most Cianothus are not all of that interesting um, in terms of their sculptural quality, but this one, lends itself to being pruned a little bit to accentuate the beautiful bark. And you can actually make it into a, a, um, a tree size plant if you want to, but of course that require a fair amount of pruning to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's uh, a beautiful early blooming Ceanothus. Um, sometimes it doesn't have the best form in a garden. It needs a little help. Um, and the, the braided uh, trunks are spectacular, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you plant them in a grove uh, so that you have more than one kind of surrounding you. Um, th there's several Ceanothus that have that characteristic, but Megacarpus, is, ha Megacarpus has it better than any other. This is one that we're kind of splitting. Uh, I was just gonna talk about delphinium species uh, and Carol's gonna talk more about uh, cardinale. Um, delphiniums are not that difficult to grow, although most people cannot grow them. And the main reason is you're watering too much uh, <laughs> or you have too many snails and slugs. Those are your sort of choices. Uh, if you can eliminate snails and slugs and you can keep your garden dry, you can have displays like these. Um, again, uh, they are seeding around in our bulb beds. Again, they're, they're quite good companions for most of our native geophytes, uh, particularly anything that's not Diclostema or <laughs> Critelia. Uh, or brodea because they just proliferate too much in a bed and will crowd out everything. But calicordus and fritillarias and others are good subjects together with these. Delphinium luteum and bakeri are both uh, listed species, but they're very easy to grow and seed around in these kind of conditions. Cardinale, uh, is a little more adaptable to garden conditions and richer soils, uh, in which case they'll get quite tall, um, although they can go completely dry. The other thing is that many times if you dig these up um, to see the bulb or whatever, there usually isn't anything. It's just dried stems with some buds on them that are very tiny. And if those get eaten or broken off, that's the end of your plant. And that's why people don't keep them long. The other thing is if you grow them together, you will get hybrids. That luteum hybrid in the lower image is crossed with nudicale. Uh, and we've been removing all of the hybrids as they come into flower. 
uh, in order to keep our populations of bees more pure. So I think we can go to the next image. Or Carol, do you want to say anything about these other ones? Or the other thing is we have grown a lot of other species delphiniums, but it's the same thing. You keep them dry in the summer and not out in blasting sun, because uh, usually in the wild they're found in grasslands or on shady uh, hillsides, <clears throat> or even if they're in the sun, there's something around them that's giving the base of them a little bit of shade or protection. Carol? I'll just say that we grew Delphinium luteum um, at SBBG successfully um, in containers. We had some plants in the ground that persisted for maybe only a couple of years and they actually did reseed but eventually they disappeared and I'm not sure if it was the snails or slugs or summer water. I completely agree about both of those being problematic. Um, but the ones in containers were very, um, um, very satisfying because you could whisk them away, you know, when they were going dormant and just put them out of, out of sight, out of mind and let them um, resume their growth when the rains return in the fall. I think there's another image. Should you include the image? Yes. Of, yeah. So here's Delphinium cardinale from the Santa Monica Mountains. All of these um, photos are from the same general trail that I hike um, periodically, um, especially in the, the late winter, early spring. And I'm looking down on a fairly sizable population in the upper left. You can see all that orange color is the Delphinium. In the center image, it's coming up through uh, California buckwheat, um, Areogonum fasciculatum, and then just a close up of the flowers. They thrive in the Santa Monica Mountains, and there are many, many different trails where I run into this plant. And typically, they are anywhere from four to six feet tall, sometimes even eight if it's been a decent winter. Just unbelievably spectacular. Um, mostly in the sun, but you can find them poking out through um, the understory and reaching for the sun where, you know, their, their roots are in a, a cooler location as, as Bart suggested. But I did grow um, this plant um, from seed in a container and got it to flower, um, didn't have a place to put it in the ground. Um, I think because of its large size, it would be better to have this, you know, in the ground if you can manage to find a place where you don't give it any summer water. And of course, hummingbirds, we didn't talk about that. They love all of these, um, these delphiniums. We also had uh, here at the Botanic Garden, um, the California pipevine swallowtails uh, visiting both of the delphiniums that I showed. The other one that I showed, uh, the picture of Cardinale that I showed was from Betsy Klepsch's garden where it's growing in very rich soil that is watered uh, mm. on occasion, uh, but no snails and slugs in that area. And, um, and actually came back for several years. I think it's still there. The other thing I should mention is that some of our um, luteums in the ground are older than 10 years. I'd wow. say some of them are probably closer to 15, maybe even to 20, the individuals, and they do seed around. Okay, well, this is um, a selection that I made from the Natural History Museum. Uh, I don't remember the actual year, but um, the distinguishing feature, as you can see from the photo and then from the name, is that the flower color is confirmed decidedly a paler yellow than the typical bright sort of crayon yellow of Ancelia californica. This plant um, just appeared in the nature gardens very early on, might have been the year that we actually opened to the public, which was 2013. And it caught my eye because it was decidedly different among all the other uh, sunflowers that uh, it was planted with. And I 
took cuttings of it and gave them to Randy Baldwin from San Marcos Growers and he propagated it and was the first to sell it commercially. And I'm not sure if other nurseries actually have it, but he is still growing it. Uh, I'd love to get it out there, um, wider distribution. I particularly like the very broad um, petals on this one as well. And the photo on the lower left is actually Randy's uh, showing some of the, the insects that visit the flowers, which also includes butterflies. So it's, I'd say fairly typical in terms of size. Uh, the photo on the upper left is more than one plant. So it looks like it's much broader than um, plain old Californica, but you know, somewhere between two and three feet tall and roughly about the same width possibly a little bit wider. Um, and it's done very well in several different locations at the nature gardens. It, it flowers best, of course, in full sun. I've and then got, okay. finished flowering. Um, we typically were cutting our encelias back um, at least a half, if not more, to rejuvenate them so that they um, were a little bit more compact the following flowering season. Bart? Um, I find that cutting back and celias is almost required. Uh, and otherwise they get too leggy and aren't pretty and don't flower as nicely as like shown here. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that at Rancho, we would cut them back hard, meaning we cut them back to stubs that were maybe just this high um, or little blobs that were this high. Um, and, and we would usually do it in early or late winter, because uh, a lot of times inland in Southern California and Celia Californica has two or three bloom cycles. Uh, the most profuse one through spring, through late spring. And then usually we would get a second bloom in late fall, usually around November. Uh, and so we would let that happen. And then we would cut them back hard in January, February uh, to let them come back. The other one uh, that isn't mentioned uh, of the species is just the one called El Dorado, which if you made that into the typical golden yellow uh, petals or, or ray flowers, um, it, it would be identical. Uh, broad uh, ray petals of that other color, nice green foliage. Um, the one thing most people, many people don't realize about Encelias is they're self-sterile. So um, the fact that we had this one planted out next to Encelia farinosa, uh, and they were both flowering for a long time, and we got lots of encelia seedlings come up. Um, and typically if you just have a single clone and you don't have other encelia species, you don't get any seedlings whatsoever, which can be nice because these get big. I'd say easily at Rancho, the species gets to be about six to eight feet wide in a season. They're also I good. Forgot to, I forgot to say something about the name. Did you did you want to say something, Bart? No, I I just said they're also and Celia is like many daisies are good cut flowers. Yep. That was one of the things I wanted to say, that it's a good cut flower. The other um, is that the paleo is um, a nod to the fact that the Museum of Natural History is um, is is known its reputation. Um, a lot of this reputation is due to um, the um, paleo, uh, paleontology uh, collection there. And the name came from a, a, a young girl, uh, uh, just came up with that when we were brainstorming, Richard Hayden and I, of what to call this thing. And she popped up with the name and it stuck. Um, there are pharaonosis growing very close to this and other Californicas in the in the nature gardens, and we we got quite a lot of intermediate forms. 
that would yeah. that would naturally appear. At Rancho, we even had some with reddish markings in them that hmm. were quite interesting. And we had all kinds of cream to near white <coughs> ones. Um, oh, from the from the mid 90s to the early 2000s, there were all kinds of color forms on the slope as you drove up the road to the building at Rancho. Okay, well, we both did this plant as well, well sort of. <laughs> this is like uh, delphinium, but Carol goes first on this. So um, I love this plant because of its foliage. Um, the flowers are very secondary, although I think they're, they're attractive. They're golden sort of um, paintbrush, if you will. But the foliage and the, the inflorescences are the whitest part. Um, the plant on the left was uh, growing at the, um, the headquarters of Theater Payne Foundation, just about ready to flower. The upper right is a close up of those blossoms, and then the lower right is the dried inflorescence. There's just a little bit of seeds left right at the very bottom, but just the, the naked um, remains of the, of the inflorescence, I think, are uh, particularly beautiful as well. This is a plant from the Northern Channel Islands. Um, I've seen it growing on Santa Cruz Island, and we did plant it in the uh, island section at SBBG. And I've grown it myself um, here in my garden here in Los Angeles. And we had it in a container on the, the steps of the library at the Botanic Garden for many, many years. Did exceedingly well um, on the north facing steps of the library. So it'll tolerate sun, but I think it actually does well in part shade and it helps to brighten up a shady location with that white, white, um, um, gray white foliage and then the even whiter flower stalks. Very, um, very dry summer loving plant that uh, once established can get by without uh, irrigation in the summertime. Pretty forgiving about soils and I'll kick it over to you, Bart. Yeah, the, uh, I grew that one in my in front, my front yard at, uh, or in Upland. Uh, and it was on the south side of a large um, Arctostaphylos glauca. And it was whiter and I didn't water my front yard um, other than to get plants established. And it was beautiful every year. <laughs> I would say that the image Carol's showing here, uh, particularly the large plant uh, on the left, um, looks like it's a bit too sprawly uh, because it's in too much or too much shade. Those branches going all the way onto the ground. Um, I find they're much more compact and full uh, if they're in full sun. And upland is hot. Uh, and my soil there was a sandy loam, so very well drained. And again, I didn't water it at all. Um, this is the southern one, uh, and this is actually a plant, this is all the same plant uh, here at the Botanic Garden, and it's grown from seed that I collected on Guadalupe Island. Hazardia cana is only known from San Clemente Island and Guadalupe Island. Um, looking at them as just plants in the garden, you'd be hard pressed to really say there's a huge difference. Um, and when Carol and I were looking at these photos initially, it was, well, are they all the same thing? Uh, who knows? Uh, Detonsa is not found on Guadalupe Island and that's where the seeds from this one came from. Uh, as you can see, this is a much fuller plant because it's not grown in the shade. Although again, it's, it's here in, in our garden where it doesn't get intense sunlight. Um, it's a gorgeous plant. Uh, it just got cut back hard. All those inflorescences are now gone. Um, 
and it will grow and produce more. It actually, um, we've been growing this one from cuttings as well. Uh, Theo grew several this year. Uh, and I have one at my house here in Point Richmond, and I have one of the detences that I brought up from um, from Upland in my house as well at my house as well. So I will have the two side by side to really look at. I would just add that although I think these are absolutely beautiful, this is you know this specimen is beautiful in the full sun, very compact. I do like these sort of. Um, uh, loose uh, form of the one that was growing in part shade um, at, equally as well, um, and especially paired with those green shrubs that were on either side of it. That's a nice contrast. Okay, well, this one is one of my picks. Um, Southern California black walnut is um, fairly common in the Santa Monica Mountains, although um, a lot of people feel that well, it has. It's 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 been compromised by development, no question. There's much less of it than there used to be. Um, I was familiar with it from the Santa Barbara area as well, um, and in Ventura County. Um, I think it's a really handsome, medium-sized tree. Um, they can get anywhere from ten to twenty-five or so feet tall, so it can be a small. Um, small tree, but it can take on fairly sizable proportions. The one on the lower left is probably 20 or so feet tall, although it's hard to tell from the scale. They have beautiful fall color, a nice golden yellow. Um, and if you're lucky, you might actually get to harvest some of the, the nuts. Um, we planted one at the nature gardens. And after I think the second or third year, it started producing fruit. Um, but um, never, never were we able to harvest any of it because the, the Eastern fox squirrels got them, every single one, even when we tried to, um, to protect them with some kind of netting, they managed to get through. So the, the, the meat, of course, is a lot smaller than commercial walnuts, but um, it is tasty um, if you're able to, to harvest it yourself. And I think it's a plant that deserves wider recognition in, in our de designed landscapes. Can be potentially very long live tree and tolerates a surprising amount of uh, um, very um, hot, dry conditions, even though I typically think of it as in more cooler, um, shadier woodland situations, but it will tolerate heat and dryness as well. Clark? Yeah, it's, um, it's widely distributed and actually there's a huge woodland of them at Benelli Park, uh, kind of, it's, that's uh, in Pomona. Uh, and again, a couple of things about this plant that does hybridize with other walnuts. And so you will see, uh, particularly in more urban situations, um, some hybrids that definitely have leaves that are much broader and more like commercial walnuts. Then the other thing is that the flavor of the walnut itself is much more intense. It's, um, um, there's a lot more flavor to it than there are in European walnuts or the Persian walnuts. Um, one other thing is that walnuts are notorious for allelopathy. That's uh, producing chemicals that come from the foliage that, that the rains wash into the soil that make it more difficult to establish other plants under them. Um, and we found that somewhat true at Rancho. Even weeds didn't come up as much under our walnuts there. Um, it's an interesting plant. Oh, and then just uh, because it's so common in greater LA and at Rancho, we had a volunteer uh, of the Tongva Nation uh, who was doing a, um, a study of all of the native plants with their Tongva names. Um, 
none of the peoples could remember what the indigenous name for walnut was. So they had to borrow one from Arizona, um, mm -hmm. which is interesting because clearly it was an important food source and, and other culturally important things, um, but that no one could remember what they called it. It's a dye plant as well as a food plant. Yes. Yeah. Ah, Juniperus communis variety sax atlas. And this is the form Point St. George. Uh, although it's mountain juniper, Point St. George actually came from a bluff right above the ocean in Del Norte County. Um, same place where the, the aster or symphiotrichum uh, Point St. George came from. Uh, has nice, beautiful blue-gray color within a bit of yellowish uh, on the stems of the new growth. It just will uh, follow the topography as you see there in the close-up image of it just draping straight down a step in our sea bluff garden and it, it conforming to the rocks there as well. Um, it doesn't get much higher than about three inches. Um, and again, it's not something that will choke out weeds. You will have to weed among it, uh, but it's a spectacular evergreen plant. Uh, there are forms of Saxatilus that are found in the High Sierra as well. Uh, some that look very much like this one. I went to visit Point St. George several times over my professional career and uh, saw this when it was alive in the 90s. Uh, when I was back more recently, it had died. Uh, there was just a dead skeleton and part of the bluff had actually fallen into the ocean. Um, so it's, and I don't know of any others of this type that are anywhere near uh, that location. So um, although there are some up at Gold Beach and at Cape Sebastian in southwestern Oregon uh, that are also prostrate and interesting plants. This can be grown in a container for many years as well uh, and would be perfectly at home in a rock garden. Carol? Uh, my experience with this is very, very limited. Um, we have a few plants of this. I keep saying present tense, I'm not there anymore, but um, the Museum of Natural History also is responsible for the La Brea Tar Pits and the Page Museum in Hancock Park. And there's a Pleistocene garden there um, that um, is planted with um, natives that um, are part of the fossil record from the tar pits. And there are a few of these um, prostrate junipers growing most in a fair amount of shade, surprisingly, um, doing okay on this, underneath the shade of a um, ever expanding uh, Monterey cypress. Um, I'm sure they would be happier if they got more sun, but uh, and they haven't exactly grown a heck of a lot over the last several years, but they're there, they're alive. Um, and doing reasonably okay despite the, uh, the intense competition. We didn't have very many vines in our book and that's because there aren't very many vines in California. We're sort of vine deficient. Um, and so I thought it would be nice to include uh, this, this honeysuckle, Lanistra hispidula. Um, you know, Bart isn't particularly enamored of this plant. I think I was with him when I took the photograph on the right of it in fruit, um, clamoring um, through some of the vegetation and that's a um, California Bay um, in the photograph with it. I think the few fruits are beautiful, the glistening um, glossy red berries and then the, the flowers that, which are various shades of um, fairly rich pink to a pale pink that are visited by hummingbirds. It's a vine that doesn't get out of control like, like Vitus californica, for example, um, or Rogers red. Um, and this nice gracing, maybe a, a, a pergola or, or growing through other uh, vegetation. Fairly quiet, but I think lovely up close. 
and the clasping leaf bases right before the uh, inflorescence is, is um, somewhat distinct as well. Um, a little bit of pubescence on the leaves and apparently a little bit on the, the, the uh, inflorescence too, if you, if you look really closely. Um, tolerates a fair amount of shade, which is another um, nice attribute and also appreciates some um, additional water in Southern California to be um, happy, but um, if it's in the right condition with a uh, fairly moisture holding clayey soil and in some shade, you can probably get by with very little. Bart? Yeah, for, for us up here at Tilden, this is, this is one of our common weeds throughout the garden. I mean, and in the canyon section, it comes up everywhere. Um, I agree, it has spectacular fruits, um, and the fruits can be yellowish to orangish to that bright red, and they do have a translucent uh, quality to them, and I think that that's one of their most attractive attributes. Uh, the other thing is that it will survive anything. You can do anything to it. You can even try grubbing it out, and it will still come back. Um, it's durable. Uh, even at Rancho, it was where it was, it was, um, and there wasn't anything you could do to really do it in except for use herbicide. Um, here at the garden, it comes up through a lot of our manzanitas and can be very attractive that way. I like Ciliosa better. Okay, well, Bart put this one in for me. <laughs> um, I, I love the texture of both um, the bird's foot fern, which is the Pelea muconata that you see here, as well as um, coffee fern, Pelea andromeda folia. Um, this one is a little bit finer in texture, um, but they both are <clears throat> dry loving evergreen ferns which um, you can't say that about too many ferns around the world. Um, I wish that these were both of the Peleas um, that I mentioned are, were more um, commonly available, but they're, they're actually very hard to find, um, which is too bad because as you can see here, softening some boulders and crevices in rocks, which is very typical of where you might find them in the wild. And they tolerate both sun as well as part shade. Um, and really um, do exceedingly well with absolutely no precipitation during the summertime at all. Um, um, maybe somebody will someday start tissue culturing these. That might be a good way to get them out there into the world. But, um, yeah, I'd say durable, 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 uh, and beautiful. Uh, they have that waxiness to them so that they shed water uh and always look clean um this particular form of mucronata has black stems others can have brown or even tannish stems uh they're really quite variable when you start looking at them in detail um, we're doing lots of native ferns and particularly the drought tolerant ones uh from spore um, and actually we have tons of pentagrammas right now um, that are coming along, as well as some Peleas too. Good. I have, I forgot to say that I have been growing Mucronata in a container. Um, I think my plant is at least 10 years old and I do periodically water it during the summertime. Um, and it, I've never divided it and it's continuing to grow and thrive. So if you don't have the right setup for it in a garden, you can certainly grow it successfully in a pot. Penstemon heterophilus GMR white. Uh, the GMR is for uh, Glendora Mountain Road in the San Gabriel Mountains. This plant was found by Rick Fisher, a landscape architect uh, in the LA basin, uh, who probably many of, many of you probably know of his work. Uh, he was in private practice for years and now works for LA. Um, and his company was Toy on Design. 
Uh, this form is a very, very vigorous albino. Uh, and with those golden yellow buds, which are quite attractive. That's a whole planting of it here at the garden in the lower image. Uh, and it's backed up by the yellow flowering form of Justicia californica, the chuparosa. Uh, that yellow form is called Dick Tilforth. Anyway, these uh, penstemons tend to be fairly durable plants for us, uh, really flowering incredibly well for months. And then they've lived for several years we still have the original ones in two gallon pots that we take cuttings from. But this year we noticed that there were a bunch of seedlings coming up around this planting uh, out in the garden. So, um, so we're just trying to make sure that everything we sell is actually from the original GMR whites and not from seedlings, which also are white. Uh, the plants get to be about 18 inches or so in height. And when they're full and uh, flopping out like that, they're, they're about three feet across. Uh, very profuse, bee and bumblebee pollinated, uh, fine textured, grassy green leaves, um, easy, full sun, good drainage preferred. Carol? Can't wait to get one. I've never grown it, so I don't have anything to add. Yeah, it's a wonderful plant. And then a weed in many people's minds, uh, and in particular, those that have lawns of grasses. But Phyllonotiflora is a California native. Uh, actually, it's native, documented native to parts of Southern California, even though it's really widespread. And there's some debate about it up here in Northern California as to how native it is. Um, and there are lots of different uh, growth habits and forms of it around. So it's hard to know whether the ones that we see are really the California version or from some other part of the world. But it's a wonderful, easy plant to grow in almost any sunny condition. You can have horrible soils. That photo is taken at a bus stop in LA in September that is not watered. Uh, and it's still looking good. It actually was, there was Bermuda planted in with it or with it. Uh, and the Bermuda was all dried up and dead and this was still alive and flowering. It's one of those plants that you can, um, you can have with dogs as long as it's established to begin with. Uh, it can get obviously dug up and stuff by dogs and other animals as new young plants, but it really is quick and easy to establish. It's a dominant plant at my house in Point Richmond. Uh, my house is from 1906, and I'm guessing it's been there since then. Uh, it will build up thatch. Um, it's oftentimes seen in ranch lawns and gardens throughout uh, California. Very easy and durable and long lived. It is a very attractive to pollinators, particularly bees. So it's not a barefoot walk on sort of ground cover. Can take water or not. This time of year up here at my garden, it's mostly dormant and in cold weather, it will go dormant, but it always comes back very reliably, loves heat uh, and you can water it or not. Simple. Carol? We planted the just some dirt flats of this in the parking lot at the La Brea Tar Pits in uh, some beds that were very poorly drained. And it's done exceedingly well. It got quite high. It's not prostrate like the one in your photo at all. It got several inches tall um, and actually started swallowing up some deer grass, um, clamoring <laughs> over the clumps. That's how happy it is. Um, and yet we planted the cultivar Carapia, which is just a crappy name for that selection that came out of Japan. Um, 
we planted that in our turf alternative display at the nature gardens and it did not do well. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because we didn't get it uh, established before um, kids started running all over it, um, which is, it's in a part of the, the museum in the nature gardens that is very popular with kids. It's on a, um, next to a Bermuda grass lawn on slopes that, um, that school children would love to run up and down. And so it may just not have stood up to all of the, the foot traffic, I'm not quite sure. But um, that particular cultivar didn't do nearly as well as I had anticipated. Yeah, we actually have that here at the garden um, and incorporated into some of our lawns. And some of this just was already here in our lawns that we've just been letting it go. And for those of you who are, who are local, if you go, uh, if you're in Berkeley and you go on Marin Avenue, the circle, the Marin circle with the fountain in the middle, the teddy bear fountain in the middle, all of that planting, that ground cover is all phyla. Um, and it will mound up uh, sort of like prostrate baccarus does with age. And it does need to be mowed at least once or twice a year, or you can let it go several years. I've never mowed mine at my house, but I don't, um, I've weed whacked it a few times. This is one of my favorite plants. Uh, there are many different forms of color forms of it. Usually the ones you see are pink, but all of these are actually the form from Guadalupe Island. Um, and I had a um, hundred seeds and I ended up with 99 plants. Um, I particularly mm -hmm. like that sort of purplish uh, that you see toward the tip, uh, very attractive in detail, but you don't see it unless you look at it really close. Um, I've grown Dodecanthian Clevelandia insularis uh, in pots for years at a time uh, in the past. It's one of those things that I think of like delphinium. If you have snails and slugs, you're not going to have it for long unless you keep it in a pot and protect it. Uh, here at the Botanic Garden, we have it in the bulb beds and it's seeding around with abandon because we have so few slugs here um, and we don't have any snails. Uh, so they are long lived. You can see that one is actually in our Baja bed because it is the Guadalupe Island one. Um, and you can see how many flowers they have. That plant is probably now about six years old. Um, I, brought them, I brought the seeds up here with me when I came here in 2013. And, um, and we actually have a lot of them around. Um, it's a springtime ephemeral. After, they're, uh, after they've flowered, they'll go to seed and then they disappear completely. They do have really interesting in fruit essences. The fruits go up and they have like a clear window at the top uh, of a dome. Uh, that you can actually look in and see the seeds. And on hot days, it, it actually will bead water on the inside. A uh, real cool little thing to look at. And again, it's just a fun spring ephemeral, much like Trillium and uh, Fritillarias. Carol? I don't really have anything to add other than the word whimsical. And that's what the, the flowers of this remind me of. It seems very apt. It's a beautiful, beautiful spring ephemeral. Yeah. Okay, well, this is a, another introduction, a fairly recent one from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And I'm not sure actually whether this was a, a um, what distinguished this particular individual that uh, of Senecio palmeri that they, chose to name silver and gold, which is definitely an apt name, but um, because I've never grown the species other than this particular selection. So there may be a, quite a bit of variation within the species. Um, Bart may have some comments on that. Another one of the beautiful white, white um, 
densely hairy um, subshrubs. This is from Guadalupe Island. Um, I'm particularly fond of the flower buds. I actually like the flower buds better than the flowers, which you can see in the lower right. They're, they're pretty, they're just little bright yellow daisy flowers in these small heads, but I, I love the, the patterns and the texture of the buds themselves. Guadalupe is a volcanic island, and so this plant, um, at least in my limited experience growing it, does seem to prefer very well-drained soil and full sun. And it flowers for a few months, starting in the, in the spring and on into summer. Um, I've, plant, I've had it both in the ground as well as in a container. I've got it in a very small pot right now that um, seems to be um, just you know, just very satisfactory despite being undoubtedly root bound. And I've cut it back after um, it finished flowering to just keep it um, compact. And the plant on the left is at SBBG growing in their new um, island um, display. Well, it's not just island, it's island and rare plants around their conservation building. And then the lower right is at the nature gardens in our pollinator meadow with poppies and various and sundry other native, um, mostly herbs and grasses. Bart? I meant to ask you, Carol, what is that large leaf plant in front of it? I think it's Areogonum molly. Oh, really? Either that or Areogonum giganteum compactum. I don't remember. Oh, I it's compactum because I see those inflorescences aren't thick enough around and are too big around even at that stage. I bet it is compactum. Yeah, and that's Ceanothus herstiorum next to that. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, um, I really was wondering and hoping to find out why silver and gold was named because I don't see that it's that different from the vast majority of them. Some of them do have narrower ray uh, flowers than, than this one, but I have uh, several of them at my house in Point Richmond uh, that are, actually they're all in bud right now. Our plants here at the garden are not that far along yet. Um, it is a gorgeous plant. Um, no one really knows how cold it can go. Um, clearly because they're here, uh, and we've been into the high 20s this year, uh, I believe on one or two days. And our plants are about three years old, some of them in the ground. Um, so, and we've been colder in past years. Um, but again, no one really is sure. Um, this plant does occur over a wide area of Guadalupe Island all the way up to the summit of Mount Augusta, which is, oh darn, I was thinking it's like 3,000 or 4,000 feet, I forget. It's pretty high and it actually can get snow on occasion, on rare occasions. So there, if you have plants <laughs> from Mount Augusta, they're probably going to be a lot more cold tolerant than the ones from low elevations on that island. Um, I agree with Carol, it's a plant that does prefer good drainage. Uh, the ones at my house in Point Richmond are in pots. Uh, one's in a one gallon and it's staying really compact and dense. Uh, and it's in full hot sun for the coast. And the other one is up against my house so it only gets afternoon sun. It's a lot more open and it's big and it's in a giant pot. It's probably about oh, three feet or so hot in height. Uh, so taller than many of them that I've seen on the island. Uh, it is just always beautiful white, even if it is a little bit etiolated because of shade, it doesn't change the whiteness of it at all. Um, very, very pretty plant. Next. I think it's going to be yours. Yep, Styrax. Uh, yeah, Styrax. Carol and I talked about Styrax, and this was a plant that we did talk about for the book itself. 
because uh, everybody likes it. It's just that it's never very uh, commonly available. And that some of the plants, like particularly some of them at Rancho, have really huge leaves and they obscure the flowers completely. Uh, this, all of these images are taken here in, in Tilden. Uh, and that is the plant here in our Southern California or desert section uh, that probably many people know and love and want to have in their own gardens because it is such a superior individual. Um, it's a plant that in the San Bernardino Mountains, it grows on the really exposed south facing slopes and never looks anything like this. Uh, but it's also up on Walker Ridge. It's, it's got an amazing di wide distribution and in some really unusual locations. The seeds are quite large, about the size of a fingernail uh, and are poisonous. So, and seem to be poisonous to everything. So it's hard to know how they got around. Uh, maybe some extinct megafauna of a previous geological time. Uh, but it can grow in full sun, part shade. Uh, it can take some summer water or not. It is deciduous. Uh, it, when it flowers, it is amazing. And then the flowers are fairly waxy or there's substance to them. So even when they drop on the ground, they make a carpet of white for several days. Um, it's, it's an outstandingly beautiful plant. Uh, they can get as tall as about 15 feet. Um, this one is probably wider than that. Um, but a lot of times they're thin, um, small plants, really incredibly variable. I don't know what else to say. They are fragrant and the uh, pipe vine swallowtails and, and other interesting insects do visit the flowers. Carol? We had this at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden in the dappled shade of sizable, mature coast live oaks and never flowered quite so copiously as the image that you have here, but it did flower reliably. And um, I've encountered this plant on trails um, in the Santa Inez Mountains in an amazing amount of shade, mm. really dense shade. And they, they were flowering, but um, you know, very, very minimally. It also sometimes has beautiful fall color kind of a clear, light yellow, hmm. which doesn't last for very long, but um, if it's been a, a cool or a cold autumn, um, you'll get some decent fall color as well. It, hmm. it's, it's a beautiful, elegant woodland plant as well as tolerating full sun. Comes up quite, quite um, significantly after a fire. Yeah, and that uh, the ones that I was mentioning in the San Bernardinos, the other plant that they're growing with is Arctostaphylos glandulosa. Mm -hmm. So extreme chaparral. And again, the Arctos were only about three feet, four feet tall. And then the Styrax would come up a few feet above them. Uh, not at all where I would have expected them to be. I think one of the reasons why it's not more common in the nursery trade is because it is very slow growing. So this plant, on the other hand, is fast. Um, this is a selection that I made while I was at uh, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden of, uh, I can never remember if the common name is California aster or coast aster of Symphiotrichum uh, chilensis. Um, this one stood out in the meadow from several other colonies of um, Chilensis because of the darker purple flowers. And that was the primary reason why um, we started propagating this and gave it a cultivar name. The image that you see on the left is at the Nature Gardens um, growing happily with uh, California goldenrod. Um, there's some Elemis Canyon prints in the background just sending up its uh, flower stalks. So it's a very 
easy to grow, reliable, um, uh, herbaceous perennial that flowers in the summer, uh, attracts a lot of insects, um, particularly butterflies, and it does spread um, somewhat aggressively. The more water it gets, the more um, it will, the more quickly it will spread. But compared to some of the other um, selections or clones that were out in the meadow, this one didn't seem to be quite as aggressive, which was another reason why I thought it was worth naming because this one can get out of control under the right conditions. And at the end of the flowering season, um, when the leaves start to shrivel up, you can just coppice it um, all the way down to the ground and then it will um, come back like gangbusters with the, with the autumn rains. Tolerates a wide range of soils, best in full sun, although it, it will take some shade, but it won't flower quite as, as strongly in the shade. Bart? I think of them more as late summer and fall uh, blooming. And again, long season. And I do think it's coast aster because the Corthrogeny or Lysingia is California aster. Thank uh, you and again, that. none of them are asters anyway anymore. Um, it will always be an aster to me. <laughs> <laughs> an asterisk. Yes. Um, I do like them uh, in general because uh, they are, they are, colorful and they're not yellow or white, which is usually what the fall blooming plants are. Uh, and so as, as it shows up so nicely here with the, with the golden rods, mm -hmm. they are, I would say, horrendously uh, invasive in general. And that the only one that I think is more so is Point St. George which is the, the low growing one, which is a terror. Uh, but if you've got difficult places where you don't mind an invasive plant, this species and this cultivar for an upright one and, and for one that only gets this high uh, for uh, a short one, uh, Point St. George, they're, they're wonderful plants. And they do, uh, they're not only nectar food, uh, for for butterflies and moths, but they're they're also a food plant for the caterpillars as well, mm -hmm. for some. And bees visit the flowers too. Sure, all kinds of insects visit yeah. these flowers. Okay, one more fern. Um, I put downy wood fern as the common name, but the Sonoran wood, Sonoran fern, I think is maybe another common name for it. There's some, there was something else I came across in the literature that came to me. Um, I think this is a beautiful, elegant, graceful, evergreen um, native fern that again, deserves more uh, recognition. Um, we, we tend to usually see its counterpart, um, if that's the correct, term, um, Woodwardia fimbriata, the giant chain fern, which is, I think of as more of a yellow green. This one tends to be a little bit deeper shade of green, um, narrower um, um, divisions of the, the pinny on the, on the um, fronds. You can see it here on the left side of the photograph and the left image um, along um, the, the dry stream bed, although this is taken during the rain, uh, this is at the um, Nature Gardens at the Natural History Museum in this constructed um, creek bed, just up from the edge of the uh, the, bay, the lower area of the uh, the creek bed, which is pretty typical of where I've seen this plant in the wild. It's uncommon, but it has a fairly wide distribution, and as I said, it's evergreen and it does slowly spread very slowly uh, by rhizomes. Um, the biggest plants that I've seen were maybe, maybe three feet tall. Um, not, didn't, I don't think I've ever seen one anywhere near as big as uh, the woodwardias um, can get, but then I've only seen it maybe three or four times in the wild. So a plant that deserves, I think, uh, a place in a, in a garden that's getting you know, fairly consistent um, irrigation and shade. It's definitely a shade-loving plant. Bart? 
Well, I just looked it up in Jepson and it calls it Sonoran Maiden Fern. That's it, Sonoran Maiden Fern. It doesn't look like maiden hair to me, so that. that no, that's but the others are maiden hair, and this is just maiden. Yeah, I like I know. that better than downy wood fern, frankly. Well, that's the way I learned it, so that's yes. what stuck for me. <laughs> um, we have we've never had it at Rancho that I can recall, but we, we do have it here in Tilden. Uh, it's in one of the um, one of the tufa uh, troughs. Uh, just next to the visitor center, and that um, uh, Kiyamara started a whole lot of these from spores. So we do have nice. a bunch coming along. And that, Carol, you gave me one that's actually field collected, um, which is, uh, I've never seen this one in the wild. I've never come across it. I think it, it's less, less common than, than you think. Yeah. Um, and again, ours usually only gets to be about maybe 18 inches or so. And we'll see uh, when we get more planted out actually in the ground. The other thing that I was noticing was that some of ours uh, seem to get some sort of a blight as the new fronds are coming up. They come mm. up too early they turn kind of black and dry out. But wow. then since this plant um, keeps growing all through the summer, uh, it, it's nothing to worry about because more come up and fill in the whole plant. So it's not something that's fatal, whatever it is. And I have no idea what it is. I've never seen that. I have it growing in a container at my, my, my garden here. Um, so it can be used also um, in, a, in, a, in that kind of situation. Yeah, and I was wondering if maybe it was because of its location or, or because it's been in that container for so long, who knows? But it's a very, very attractive fern. We mm -hmm. don't have anything else that looks quite like it. The next one is one that I put in because it is a native and it is, or it was, one of the super uh, popular house plants from the late 60s and the 70s uh, as piggyback plant. And it was around everywhere. And nobody really thought of it as being a California native plant from the Santa Cruz mountains all the way up the Pacific coast. Um, that's it actually uh, at Fern Canyon up along the north coast on the left. And then <clears throat> cool gold with that uh, brilliant sort of yellowish chartreuse new growth color uh, is a cultivar that was selected. Uh, that's a uniform ye golden yellow or pale, whatever you want to call that color. There's a, the other widespread uh, cultivar called Taft's Gold which is kind of checkered modeled throughout and varies from leaf to leaf. That's been around for a long time. Uh, cool Gold, I think is patented or trademarked, one or the other. Uh, so it's only going to be around more limitedly. That one's actually at my house. It's, it's an interesting plant. They do want water. They don't like to dry out, particularly as a house plant. They don't have a huge extensive root system. They're super easy to propagate. As you can see in the green photo, right at the bottom in the middle, they produce new plantlets from the base of each leaf blade. And they, the plants can get quite large uh, <laughs> on the leaves. And then all you have to do is cut the leaf off and there's even uh, root initials. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're on them and you just plug them down into any sort of moist mix and off they go. Super easy to grow. If you're in a hotter, drier area or if you have bad water quality, that's the thing that'll really show up on your plants negatively. The edges of the leaves will turn brown and they won't be attractive at all. But otherwise, they're very easy to grow. Flowers are brown and interesting 
but not anything anybody grows the plant for. Carol? Well, my first introduction to that plant was as a house plant when I was living in Michigan, so that's how I know it. <laughs> um, we grew it in the redwood section at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden as one of the many ground covers. And I tried planting it underneath our redwood trees in the parking lot at the museum. Unfortunately, that, that bed is, was incredibly fast draining soil and we had to water a lot to keep the redwoods happy and it was never quite enough to, um, to satisfy the, um, the Tolmias. So they really didn't persist, unfortunately, which is too bad because we needed you know, something to tolerate the shade. Um, even though we were pretty consistently um, adding compost to, um, to hold more moisture in the soil. So it definitely does not like to dry out, as Bart said. Last one. Yes. Um, the other one, uh, my last selection was Vaccinium ovatum, another plant that we had a lot of discussion about uh, initially to, for the book because it, it is such a useful plant. Um, evergreen, thick foliage, uh, can be blue to shiny green. Uh, the form on the left is from the Channel Islands from Santa Cruz, where they tend to be very erect, almost uh, fastidiate in, in growth habit. And that you can even see on that left hand image, even the inflorescences are more upright and there's lots of flowers on them. That image on the right of the close-up of the plant and flower is actually an anomalous branch on one of those coast or island plants. Uh, and typically they don't flower that heavily uh, and sometimes just, you know, in little bunches. Um, but the other wonderful thing about the plant is the fruit, uh, which is edible, huckleberries. Uh, and um, what probably could be done would be to uh, make some selections for size of fruits uh, to get them larger or to get better or different flavors. Um, it's a very interesting plant. It can be slow. The lowest image there is at Rancho Santa Ana at the north end of the Mesa under uh, some of the large coast live oaks and that they were there when I arrived and they never got any bigger uh, when I left um, 24 years later. Uh, and that, uh, but you can see all that bright green is the new growth in that particular year. Uh, so they were happy enough, they just didn't grow big. The image right above it is here in the Botanic Garden as well, under our um, Canyon Live Oak, which I hate gardening under canyon live oaks. You, it's difficult to grow anything under them. When I arrived, there were these really tall scraggly um, vacciniums under there. And I said, well, let's just coppice them all. And that's, uh, they were cut completely to the ground. And that's what they looked like uh, four to five years later. Very, very nice, good looking plants. Uh, they are ericaceous. So sometimes they can be fussy, but they don't need lots of water to be happy. Pretty adaptable for an ericaceous plant that's not a manzanita. Carol? I have some memory of them being susceptible to thrips hmm. at SBBG if they were stressed. Hmm. But otherwise, I agree with, with what you said about them being pretty adaptable. The, they are amazingly slow, at least they were in my experience um, in Santa Barbara, which means they could be maybe used as a bonsai. You know, <laughs> people who are bonsai enthusiasts or in a Japanese style garden, I think they would blend right in um, with manzanitas and some conifers that, um, that would, you know, kind of evoke that particular type of, uh, of theme. We actually had some adjacent in, in the Japanese garden at uh, the tea garden at SBBG, if my memory serves. 
It's very handsome. I wish that they produced more fruits reliably because it's pretty slim pickings unless, you know, you get a banner year. So hard to well, get a meal out of that. Birds get a lot of them. Yes, they do. So it's good for wildlife for sure. Okay. How are you guys doing then? Is that it? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. It's almost nine o'clock. So. I right. know. Do you have like about 10 minutes for maybe um, questions? Sure. From the audience there. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, you guys now need to do a net new book because <laughs> stuff there. There are many, 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 many we, more plants. Right. <laughs> Volume two. Yeah. You guys can unmute yourselves and, un, um, and put yourself back on video if you guys have any questions. I'm going to stop sharing. We'll do gallery view here. Um, I don't have a picture. But I was wondering about that purple haze cultivar uh, that is so voracious and wants to take over uh, the world. I wonder if that would do well in a hell strip as a way of putting it someplace where it can ramble without being feared. It's a good idea as long as your your municipality doesn't mind something that get that gets two to three feet tall. Oh, uh -huh. some some right. Um, some areas they re restrict what you can plant in your hell strip to like 18 inches uh -huh. and wasn't there that point something taller than that yeah it's it's that certainly you could put point saint george out there right that would never get too tall the nope. only thing i would say or caution you about is most hell strips in many garden areas the sidewalk is cracked or has some uh, yes, spaces and this plant will find that space and will get it to your front yard uh, to, the, to the area beyond the hell strip and you might regret it. Thank you. Although they are very pretty. And they don't need a lot of water. No. Now, if you have heavier soils, they're happier. Good. Good, good. But Cianosis, uh, what can you recommend as the uh, most, uh, the deepest blue, like a cobalt blue for Cianosis? I notice there's quite a variety in colors, but I, I don't know what they are. I see them, but I never know what they are. Probably the darkest ones of all are, there are three that I'd put in that category. Dark Star, Julia Phelps, and Concha. Oh. Uh, okay. Those three are definitely, or in my mind, the darkest. If you want one other to add to that list, there probably are two that I'd put in the next tier, and they're both giants. Uh, <laughs> Gentian Plume and Sierra Blue. Uh, both of those are very, are, are definitely more blue-blue, but very, very intense. Whereas those others are more cobalt blue, really deep, vibrant blue. And that why they really uh, show up so much, in my opinion, is because on, on Dark Star and Julia Phelps, the foliage is also very dark. Um, and that it's the yellow um, pollen that makes them pop so visually, in my opinion. Did um did Kurt Zadnick come out of um oh. your garden? That one has incredibly dark blue flowers. Yes, that one is it's not actually commercially a, available, but it's beautiful. It's around. It's definitely around. We have yeah. it here, but it's actually a Roger Raich selection um, from Salt Point Park, uh, State Park, I believe, and it's um, it does have that really intense. Uh, blue flower, cobalt yep. blue. Yep. It's one though that I've always found, and it's Ceanothus griseus. Uh, right. It's, I've always found that the foliage color with that intense dark blue, it doesn't read. A lot of times I would, I would notice there are lots of flowers on the plant, but I just don't see them. It's so dark, they almost don't register. Yeah, that, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. It's an amazing plant. Yep. Um, I have two questions. Um, Bart, what's your theory about 
um, that vaccinium that never got tall? Uh, is it because it was in sun or, or something to do with the soil or? I think it was mostly just the environmental conditions. It was so hot and dry at Rancho Santa Ana in Claremont. <clears throat> I mean, where uh, Claremont is the last city in Los Angeles County. Uh, the next county over is San Bernardino, uh, and which is really hot and dry. And Claremont is pretty hot and dry too. Um, I was surprised that they actually were alive and that they survived for all of the many years I was a mm -hmm. rancho and even before. Because like I said, when I arrived there, they were around that same size. And when I left, they were around the same size. <laughs> um, just kind of interesting. But I would say hot, dry air. Um, they were on really heavy clay soil there and lots of air pollution, just all kinds of things that most plants don't like. Yeah, I mean, they look, that was very attractive plant. <laughs> yes, it always shocked me that they looked that good. Yeah. Um, I have a question also, what you said about pruning back the baccarus. Um, can you uh, prune down below leaves, beyond the, the leaves? Oh, yeah. Yes. You can, you can go down to, you know, for a long time at Rancho, when we were cutting back the Baccarus uh, Twin Peaks, which is actually a selection from Rancho, um, and but yet it's from Twin Peaks in San Francisco, uh, that we would be careful and you know just prune it. And then it just got to the point where this is gonna take forever. And so we got a brush mower, you know, those horrible things that really beat everything up. And we just ran it over them and they look awful and everyone complained. And I said, don't worry, they'll be back. And then I just threw down some nitrogen fertilizer and two months later, nobody knew anything had happened. They said, boy, they look good in their flat this year. What happened? So yes, you can do almost anything to a Baccarus. Well, in terms of the, uh, the fact that you had the uh, female uh, plant, uh, no, that was Carol, I think. Um, yes. Yes. Um, I, I was curious about um, the aesthetics of the white flowers. Do you, do you like that? I did. I, uh -huh. I, I think it's attractive. Um, it's and of course, of, you know, personal preference. I thought that they were kind of at Rancho when we had one. I mean, because I think we had probably the first centennials planted in a public garden in California because we planted them in the early 90s. Um, and that no one, we didn't, had no idea what it was going to do. Uh, but it got huge and then it just had these clouds of seeds and we were all worried that we were going to get seeds all over the place. Fortunately, that did not happen, but uh, some people really liked the look because it just looked like a big, what, almost like a huge wad of white lint. <laughs> uh, it was kind of, you know, that's a bad way to put it, but that is sort of how it looked. And that, um, and then winds came and they all blew away. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I was wondering about uh, about that. The well, it's the reason partly why I think that that's appealing is because I know how um, valuable all those flowers are for wildlife. You know, right. All of the insects that they support. So. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Oh. And actually, just one thing to add on to that is that um, everyone wanted it to be a male selection so it wouldn't do those clouds of seed heads. And so they did actually introduce a male version of Centennial uh, uh, several years later out of Arizona. Uh, it, I forget the name on it. I do have that. 
Isn't that uh, Starn? Yes, it's Starn is the cultivar name and there's a trademark name that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And it actually does not get as high as Centennial. Mm -hmm. It stays lower, more like uh, Twin Peaks and Pigeon Point, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of range. Whereas Centennial easily gets up to about, oh, four to five feet. Right. If, mm -hmm. Unless you take action. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Carol and Bart for enlightening us with all these neat new plants for our garden. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us. I want to remind everybody about the program next um, month. Send me your um, plant pictures for the forum and I'll see you next month on March 15th. And thank you everybody for coming. And again, thanks Bart and Carol for sharing. We appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Night, everybody. Bye.